Obviously, the planes are going to need a little bit of assistance. Every engineer in the world's gonna know it's fake. Engineers don't control the media. But they're all over the internet. And that internet thing could really take off. Well, let's ask the shrink. Alfred, does it matter if some nerds mouth off? Not if the media makes it clear that the terrorists are responsible. That is what the people will know. Subsequent information will cause a conflict and the people will resist. And that Nazi that Michael was quoting was correct when he said that anyone who challenges the government's story, you can denounce for lack of patriotism. Bringing attention to the destruction of the three World Trade Center towers in New York City on September 11, 2001, and a whole lot more. This is 9-11 Freefall. Hello, everyone. This is Andrew Steele back again for yet another show, and this is going to be a really good one today. I've been promising for weeks to get our Olivier, the writer of Operation Terror, on here to talk about himself and the film, and lo and behold, he is here. I'll be interviewing him shortly, so stay tuned for that. If you want to know more about the film Operation Terror and see the trailer, go to OperationTerror.com and check that out while you listen to this program. Now, if this is the first episode of 9-11 Freefall you've ever come across, what we do here is talk about 9-11 science truth, 9-11 activism, and we feature scholars and activists who are grasping the reins of America's destiny by exposing a crime that continues to affect our society today. I'm talking about 9-11, specifically the fact that all the so-called quote-unquote authorities we rely on to protect our interests have lied to us, and that Towers 1, 2, and 7 were destroyed on 9-11 in a pre-planned controlled demolition. Simple science proves this, folks, and we've covered a lot of the scientific evidence in previous shows, so if you want to listen to interviews with people like Richard Gage or David Chandler or Jonathan Cole or Mark Basile and others, go to 911freefall.com and check them out. If you want to see the evidence laid out even more thoroughly and want to find a great place to offer your talents to help in the cause of exposing the controlled demolition evidence, then of course you need to open up a new tab on your browser and check out Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth. This is an organization I talk about every week on this show, folks, which has been out there tirelessly laying out the evidence and leading the charge for 9-11 Science Truth since 2007, when Richard Gage founded it. It's produced movies like Blueprint for Truth, Solving the Mystery of Building 7, and, of course, its latest, 9-11 Explosive Evidence Experts Speak Out. All right, some of the experts featured in that film have been guests on this show. So if you've got that new tab open, go to ae911truth.org and browse AE's webpage. All right, there you're going to see there are a number of volunteer opportunities available to you. You can also keep up on AE's latest news and outreach efforts. As well, you can go to the law enforcement information page that's in the rotating banner at the top there, and you can download a copy of Richard Gage's letter to police chiefs and sheriffs that went out on January 16th, and you can bring that to your local law enforcement officials to plant that seed in their minds. Let them know the actual nature of the 9-11 crime and get them on our side now so they'll be on our side later on if the real perpetrator of 9-11 decide to try it again. This is a full-out war for America's future, my friends. All right? Not rocket fire and missiles, but a war of information. And the more we shine a light on the 9-11 controlled demolition evidence, the more we chip away at the false reality wall that our government and sold-out media has built around us. Okay, so some 9-11 related news, and this first bit of news I consider to be related to 9-11 in that it's a precedent and it's something for 9-11 truth activists to study for their own work in trying to get a new investigation of 9-11. This involves a 1994 bombing that took place in Buenos Aires, Argentina, which, even though the case remains unsolved, some of Argentina's courts and, of course, eager Western governments and Israel blames Iran for sponsoring. Um, The excerpt I'm going to read is from Al Jazeera. It says, Argentina and Iran have reached a breakthrough in the investigation of a Jewish center bombing that killed 85 people in Buenos Aires 19 years ago, agreeing to establish an independent international truth commission led by a jurist with high moral standing and legal prestige to examine Argentina's worst terrorist attack. The commissioners will examine the evidence and recommend how to proceed based on the laws and regulations of both countries. Then commissioners and Argentine investigators will travel to Tehran to question the suspects. 
Cristina Fernandez Kirchner, Argentina's president, described the agreement signed on Sunday in Africa by foreign ministers Hector Timmerman and Ali Akbar Salehi as historic. Then it later says in the article, Argentinian prosecutors have formally accused six Iranians of coordinating the AMIA attack under orders from their government. Among them is Iran's current defense minister, Ahmed Vahidi. Investigators have spent years seeking to interrogate the suspects with the help of Interpol, but Iran's government has refused until now to make them available. Then, it goes on, previous Argentinian probes resulted only in failures and scandal, with a trial that ended up being a farce after high-level officials were accused of covering up evidence and deliberately misdirecting investigators, Fernandez said in a series of posts on the Twitter microblogging service. In contrast, this process, which needs legislative approval in both nations, provides a legal framework with due process rights for the accused that could be a model for conflict resolution, Fernandez said, and it puts the dispute firmly in the hands of legal experts overseen by independent arbitrators. In a tweet, she said the deal was important because the AMIA tragedy can no longer be used as a chess piece in a game of faraway geopolitical interests. Now, to me, this sounds like a reasonable step to getting an understanding of what happened, and it gives Argentina a chance to interrogate the suspects now, but of course the Israeli government and uh, Western media everywhere are freaking out over this. Now, this fell under my radar for a few weeks. I just learned about the story... Uh, recently, but the only coverage I see about this right now uh, out of any corporate American newspaper is either demonizing Kirchner for doing what is essentially a murder investigation, or at their best, newspaper writers are lacing their stories with their usual arrogance and sarcasm as if the case is closed already. Now, you know, obviously this bombing is not the same as 9-11, okay? 9-11 was bigger, more spectacular, and it happened to the iconic World Trade Center towers. And that's not to say that the lives lost in 1994 were any less important than those lost on 9-11. Please, please don't misunderstand me, folks. But the fact that the Argentinian government is willing to take a second look at this bombing is a good thing, and we should be looking at how this energy for a new investigation came about there. Okay, maybe there were some activists there busting their butts to get this crime reexamined. I don't know. Obviously, this is territory we don't get into much on this show, um, but the Israeli officials you know, who are expressing their outrage at this new investigation might want to check themselves in their own history, specifically the uh, Levant Affair of 1954. Google that. Okay, so corporate media reporters are willfully uninformed and arrogant, um, a lot of them are at least, and this next story is going to further illustrate that. I said last week I wasn't going to talk much about the painting defacement in France where some woman wrote AE911 on a famous painting, and I'm not going to talk about that. Instead, I'm going to talk about coverage of that, in particular the London Guardians. Now, Wayne Costa brought this to my attention after the show last week, it's a report about the incident written by Kim Willisher at The Guardian, which completely and brazenly misrepresented what AE911 Truth stands for. Okay, it said this when, when writing about the organization. It said, the organization AE911Truth.org has an online petition signed by more than uh, 16,400 people calling on the U.S. Congress to open an independent inquiry into the 9-11 attacks in September 2001. It rejects the idea that Islamists flew two planes into the World Trade Center. Well, no, it doesn't, Kim. It doesn't talk about Islamists or who flew planes into the World Trade Center. All right, 8911 Truth doesn't go in and get into that. It doesn't point any fingers at any party. And if you actually re read that line again, I'm going to say it again for the audience. Okay? It rejects the idea that Islamists flew two planes into the World Trade Center. Okay, some people might reasonably read that and get the impression that AE 911 Truth doesn't think planes hit the World Trade Center at all, which is totally erroneous. And folks, this is the best sloppy journalism. Now, of course, when members of AE 911 Truth contacted the paper about this, they eventually printed a correction. No apology, they just wrote a correction. And I don't think Kim Willisher's day was ruined too much over the fact that she didn't bother to do her research, but as one of our members pointed out in these specific words, and I concur with him, he said, how did the reporter and the editor manage to screw this up so completely? They can't credibly say they had AE 911 Truth confused with some other website that questions 
The woman who defaced the painting did not make a general statement about 9-11 Truth. She alluded to AE 9-11 Truth specifically. So why would the reporter or editor working on a story about a woman who defaced this painting visit any other 9-11 Truth website and get confused about which organization believes what about 9-11? Well, I can try to answer that myself. Um, and here's my answer. Like, you know, like everybody in Western culture, these reporters and editors, too, have a worldview crafted for them that sets down parameters of what is and isn't considered reasonable inquiry. Okay? Now, I can't speak for the reporter because I never met the woman, but I can sure make a pretty educated assumption based on most people I meet, and especially those in positions of some minor fame like quote-unquote mainstream reporters. It's kind of like how people react differently to accidentally running over a, a cute puppy with their car than they would over a field mouse. And even, you know, even though both species are considered animal life, because dogs are domesticated, which really just means they're more subservient to their human masters, uh, most people would consider that life more valuable and will, ex will express more grief if they harm it. And same is the case with what gets covered in the media. Because, you know, because these mommy and daddy stand-in bosses at varying levels, and, and including levels of government, these same people that, that pat their ambitious uh, reporters on the back from it, the infancy of their careers and tell them when they're doing a good job or they're doing a bad job, because they're all part of the same normalcy bias and reinforce the established standards of what deserves coverage and investigation, people in these systems will regard anything that falls outside of those artificial standards like they would the field mouse in the example I just gave. Again, you know, they, they misquote or misrepresent an establishment-approved organization or public figure, the quote-unquote domesticated, subservient animal in this case. They'll stumble all over themselves, apologizing, and, and heads will roll over it. Okay, but, but if they misquote or misrepresent something that the establishment system has deliberately tagged with a quote-unquote unacceptable or undomesticated label, then reporters and editors will just sort of utter a disinterested, oh... They'll just go on sipping uh, their milk straws. All right, now, in this case, Kim Willisher likely didn't do her research on AE because she didn't care about doing her research on AE. You know, like a lot of people who are being flattered and paid by the system, questioning anything about 9-11 is an instant non-starter for them. All right, people only respond to something when there's a threat, and since the hammer won't come down on a quote-unquote mainstream reporter when they misrepresent organizations like AE 911 Truth, this is how they can callously write about 9-11 truth groups with the same media-generated disinfo and prejudice and add their own to reinforce the media lie system. And maybe they won't care to do their research on us until it's too late. Okay, before we get to our guests, we're going to do what we do every week. We're going to take about 10 seconds of silence to remember the victims of 9-11 and their families and everyone who died in the wars that followed 9-11. So we're going to do that right now. And that's 10 seconds. Folks, 10 seconds of dead air is the least we owe to the people who died on that terrible day, who not only had to die, but who continue to have their murders lied about. All right, the truth will win out in the end, but the question is, how much grief will the world suffer before it does? How much will people take before they acknowledge what's right in front of them? The answer is up to you, of course. You know, that I'm speaking to the person listening to me right now. Are you going to sit down and let history happen to you? Are you going to let it be created by monsters that care nothing about the sanctity of human life? Or are you going to stand up and assume your birthright is the co-creator of our combined existence? It's all up to you. Okay, 9-11 truth. 9-11 science truth. That ends the wars and, and it restores freedom around the world. And only you can make it happen. Now, before I introduce our guests, normally our focus on the show is the Twin Towers and World Trade Center 7 and the evidence of controlled demolition of those buildings. It's a very focused mission that we maintain because I feel that it is the strongest evidence to get a new investigation, as does AE 911 Truth, who I volunteer for. However, Operation Terror does cover a wide spectrum of the 9-11 crime, and we have such a great opportunity to talk to the writer of that film that today a lot of our conversation will go into other aspects of 9-11. So I'll reiterate, like I do every week, the opinions expressed 
on this show don't always reflect those of AE 911 Truth, which only focuses on the science of the building destructions in New York. We speak for ourselves on this show, and the 911 Science Truth is just one part of a wider field of research that we will briefly touch upon in this episode. 50 billion barrels of oil in the Caspian Sea, and I can't get it out. <laughs> Sir? And we defeated Saddam, and now... The Europeans are getting the oil. Have a seat, Aaron. All these red dots, oil fields over which we do not have control. Now that has to change if we intend to continue as the world's superpower. We have a military that is greater than the rest of the world combined. Yet we continue to allow these petty dictators to determine who will control their oil. We need to use our military might to take that oil. America's grand strategy should aim to preserve and extend our military advantage as far into the future as possible. The problem is the pacifist mindset of the American people. To wake them up, we need a catastrophic and catalyzing event, like a, a new Pearl Harbor. You mean like what the Bureau tried to do in 93 to the World Trade Center? Well, that did not work out so well. We can't rely on amateurs to provide the desired results. That is where you come in. I was very impressed by your operations in Pakistan. Are you familiar with Michael Goldberg? Yeah, he's the uh, Hollywood faggot uh, film writer. Michael is a brilliant man. He's working on a script about Muslim terrorists that attack America. His script will change the world. Your job will be to implement his vision, and you will show him the respect he deserves. Yes, sir. We also have a few members of the Bush administration who are working on this, and they want to be back in office to take full advantage of the situation we are going to create. Oh, so you're, you're uh, working towards a new Bush administration? Perhaps. You're not talking about that frat boy in Texas. The office of president is merely a figurehead, and I'll be using his cabinet to implement policy. Anyway, this is none of your concern. Here is an outline of Michael's script. We're setting up an office on the 25th floor of World Trade Center 7 for your team, and on your way out, make sure that my secretary has your account information so that we can supplement your salary. So the guest is, today is Art Olivier. He is the former mayor of Bellflower, California. He was a 2000 libertarian opponent to Dick Cheney for vice president, and he was Arnold Schwarzenegger's 2006 opponent. More recently, he is the writer and producer of the award-winning 9-11 thriller Operation Terror, which we have talked about many times on this show. Welcome to 9-11 Freefall Art. Well, thank you, Andrew. Now... Uh, since this is your first time on the program, br briefly tell us, how did you wake up to the 9-11 truth evidence, and what prompted you to take action? Well, I was listening to a uh, local radio station, KFPK, and somebody got on the radio, and they were talking about Building 7, which I had never heard of before. So when I got home, I went to look it up, and I saw a controlled demolition. Amazing. So you basically watched it, and you could just see from the way the building fell that this was obviously a controlled demolition. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I, I've worked, uh, I've built a lot of steel frame buildings, and and I, I know how hard they are to put together and how hard they are to take apart, and something like that just doesn't happen naturally. Now, something you just said you worked hard to build a lot of steel frame buildings, and, and this wasn't in your uh, in your bio. I just want to ask you, in, in what field were you working to build steel frame buildings? I used to work um, for McDonnell Douglas and Boeing, and I was a um, project manager for the building of most of the um, uh, biggest projects there and in, in here in Long Beach. Amazing. Well, that's great. So you got a very illustrious uh, past here and a lot to bring to the table in terms of expertise. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about the movie and just the, the art of, of making a movie, which I don't know a lot about. So, um, you know, first of all, how did you come up with an idea to make a, a Hollywood-like film about 9-11 from this angle? 
Well, I, I think that uh, it's something that's needed. There, there are no other movies like this, which starts two years before the uh, 9-11 attacks. And um, it, it had, helps people to understand how something like this could have happened. Now, the way that I, I developed the story is when I saw the passenger list for the, for the four flights on 9-11, um, what, what was amazing was it was all the people that had defense-related jobs on those passenger lists. And, you know, working in the aerospace industry, I thought, well, this just can't be a coincidence that all these highly technical people were on those four flights. And then so I, I started looking into what their areas of expertise was, and that's how I uh, developed the story for Operation Terror. What what um, experience had you had in in writing films before this? <laughs> None at all. So you just kind of took pen to paper and were inspired and came up with a, a great script. Now, how do you how do you somebody pursue something like this? Because I, I I'm I'm totally blown away by what you did. It's it's a creative work. It mixes creativity with. You know the the crime of nine eleven and the fact and the need to do something about it. And as I always say on this show, you know, there's just a certain segment of the population that will watch a, a documentary or watch a presentation being given, like a speech. Their brains, you can see, it kind of float out of their heads. It's just it's just a kind of the way society is now. But what you do is you appeal to the people who need mood music and and drama, and uh, you know they can get their their story that way. So I, I want to praise you for taking the bull by the horns and doing this. How do you go about making a Hollywood style film, and you know how do you raise money for something like this? Uh, you don't raise money for it. it it's self financed. Um, you know, it was a a mortgage on my house <laughs> um, is what uh, financed this. Um, the after I left Boeing in, in year two thousand, um, I became a um, real estate developer, building small subdivisions around uh, Bellflower. and putting a movie together is somewhat like a uh, doing a subdivision where you instead of drawing up the plans, you write a script instead of uh, hiring. Uh, all these construction workers, you know, you hire uh, a, um, a director and uh, all the kind of staff and crew that you need. So it, it's like it's like doing a, um, a subdivision, um, but uh, in a different field. Well, that's amazing. And, uh, you know, again, you're doing this with having absolutely no experience. So how long did it take to, to make this movie? Well, the research that I was doing before, even before I wrote the script, um, after I had the idea to do this, it was well over a year. And then about another half a year to write the script. And then uh, once I was able to hire the director, Paul Cross, um, then, um, of course, he told me that everything I did was wrong. <laughs> and uh, I had to do it the right way, uh, which we did. And um, so just developing it before we even um, did anything else was, was over two years. And then, and then we had the casting process. We have 75 paid actors in the movie and about 50 extras. And of the, of the 75 actors, we went through close to 1,000 during the casting process um, where we would put out a uh, request for a person, let's say he's between the ages of 30, 39, uh, white, male, um, you know, approximately six foot tall or something like this. And we would get about 300 people that would apply for that one role. And then we would go through and we would look at the pictures and then we would look at their reels and maybe we would invite 10 of them to come down and actually try out for the part and then we would pick the best one from that. Now, when you got you picked out your cast and you're working with them, how many people, I mean, you, know, you don't have to give me an exact number, but, you know, just... Overall, people who were familiar with the controversy around 9-11, you know, how many people were already familiar with this? And what was the reaction of actors to, to the script? And what was their attitude about what they were a part of? Well, I think a very small percentage understood uh, what happened on 9-11 before they got the role in the movie. And um, some people were just blown away by it. Uh, but the ones that uh, did know about 9-11, they were very excited to, to be part of this movie. And um, the ones that didn't know about it, I would say the majority of them understood 
what really happened on, on that day uh, after they were done. Because, you know, they went home and they started doing a little research, especially on their own characters, and a lot of their characters were, were based on real people. So the... Um, um, they would look up their characters and find out, you know, well, you know, like, for example, Barry Jennings, you know, he didn't, um, before he actually shot that day, he, he didn't know that Barry Jennings was, was a real character. And, uh, once he saw the video of, of Barry Jennings and he understood uh, the, um, the, uh, the importance of the, of the movie. People think actors just show up and read a script and go home. No, there's a lot of work that goes into being an actor, and it's funny. Yeah, you say that. You know, some of these people didn't even know that these people really existed, and so their own getting into the role might have been their uh, awakening to the 9/11 truth, their own personal journey. So the film gets made. Um, then why? You know, I, I hear all the time this is a film has been banned from theaters. Now, is that true? Um, and if it is true, tell us tell us that story. How do you how do you get told that it's banned from theaters? Well, not really. I mean, what I can do and what I have done is I can rent a theater. Now, like most movies, it can come out and uh, be played at the theaters, and you don't you don't have to actually rent a theater. But but in, in my case, I do, and uh, that's prohibitively expensive to do that. Um, the The distribution has been very difficult. My publicist called. I think she called every single uh, distributor in in, La- in Hollywood, and, and none of them were interested in um, in taking the movie on. Uh, they just um, some of them would would say that uh, because there were no top name uh, actors in the movie that it wouldn't sell. Other ones say that it's too controversial of a topic uh, that they have corporate um, corporations that they deal with that wouldn't look favorably upon uh, distribution of, of such a movie. So it's not really banned. It just, just can't be um, dist- uh, distributed in the United States. And, and I kind of I knew that from up front. I knew that it, um, distribution in this country would be very, very difficult. Well, no, I understand that. And there's always a way of banning things without officially banning them. So it's almost like banned is a general term for the for for saying. Uh, Distribution companies are uncomfortable with this film. That it's very, it's too controversial, and that your average audience, which is you know going out and watching Zero Dark Thirty, and they're talking about giving that movie an Oscar, that that propaganda piece, um, you know, they're out there watching that. Well, this is going to challenge their worldview. That uh, you know, the, the worldview that the the regular mainstream, the uh, you know, that's been sold to us is going to challenge their worldview, and people don't like to have their worldview challenged when they're when they're trying to be entertained. Um, and you know, I understand that. I don't agree with that. I think this film needs to be seen by everybody. It, again, it, it approaches the whole fable of 9/11 from an angle that most people will never see it at, and it actually kind of brings things home. You know, and I, I talked about this on the show uh, a few weeks ago, but, you know, intellectually I know that there was a decision to pull the buildings, to, to bring down the, the trade towers, that somebody somewhere had to make that decision, but to actually see a dialogue between two people, uh, you know, where somebody says, bring that building down, and and, and I, if I remember in the movie, one character is saying, you know, well, wait, and the other guy's saying, no, I don't I don't get paid to, uh, to stand and wait, or something to that effect, and he brings the building down. It's really breathtaking to see that because it really it really humanizes it and really puts it in a light that makes the the plot even seem even more real to you know to to the viewer. Yeah, yeah, they, um, that help for the person, that, especially that doesn't uh, hasn't done much research on nine eleven to to see how this could have happened. Okay, so let's get into nine eleven and Operation Terror a little bit now. Operation Terror is a fictional movie, of course, and it, but it's based on real events and real facts about that day. And something people always say about 9-11 is this. They say, if the U.S. government was behind it, how could it involve so many people with nobody coming forward? Now, for our audience members who haven't seen the movie yet, are, can you address that and give a little preview you know, of how that's covered in the movie? Well, let's see. I got 75 uh, eight actors, and uh, very few of them were in on the plot. Um, a lot of the the actors that we have in the movie are the engineers that had worked on the development of the weapons used on 9/11, and they um, did so unwittingly, and they were disposed of uh, as passengers of the four airplanes. So it 
you just really need the leadership to be in on it and not the people that are actually doing their day-to-day duties. Right, it's called compartmentalization. Only a few people at the top need know about it, and then everybody else is just doing their job. And I ask our audience to think about this. How often do you question orders from your boss at work? And you know, forget about the government. Let's say you work at uh, even at McDonald's. You know, I mean, you get given an order and you do it, and you move on with your day. Now, also imagine that it's nine eleven, and you're being told. And I'm just going to use this as an example. Uh, you know, to to clear away the rubble from the World Trade Center. You know, you might be given an excuse that, uh, you know, body there, there's bodies in there or there's human waste in there and that, you know, we need to get this out of New York before uh, before you, know, you start having a health hazard or something. And you're, it's 9-11, it's a, it's a terrifying event. You're thoroughly terrorized along with the rest of the country. People are more compliant and they're going to go along with it. And so then you have that compartmentalization aspect uh, added too that people don't see the full picture. Only a handful of people see the full picture picture and that's exactly how a plot like this could could be undertaken and and successfully accomplished without anybody and most of the people participants even knowing that they were a part of it now the the premise of this film is that 9-11 was carried out primarily because of oil now obviously oil was a big part art but do you think that that was the sole motivation of the 9-11 plot no of course not no, I mean, there was other things that were in place uh, before 9-11. You know, you had the Patriot Act to to reduce our civil rights. Um, and um, the the ever-expansion of the uh, military-industrial complex. Um, there was uh, the opium fields in Afghanistan that they wanted to, uh, to replant. Uh, the Taliban had wiped those out. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of different aspects of it, but of course, in, in a movie like this, you don't want to make it too complicated. And now, what's funny too is throughout the movie, you see certain political figures like Dick Cheney portrayed in it. But if I remember right, in this movie, I didn't see George Bush. Now, how much do you think our presidents, just generally, our presidents play in these kind of affairs? And if you think it, it depends on the president, how much do you think George Bush was aware of what was happening on that day? No, presidents, they are selected to be a public relations person, basically. They just read the teleprompter. They don't, uh, they're not really in on it. They don't do the planning. It's not like, a, you know, George Bush did 9-11. That's just, um, I think he may have known that something was going to happen that day, but I, I doubt if he really had the details. Well, you're right. And I see these people, and you know, people like Bill Maher, who will try to uh, dismiss. And it's, and it's not really important what Bill Maher thinks about anything, except that he's attacked 9/11 uh, truth before on his show, so it's become kind of a, a war of words. But you know, he said things like George Bush couldn't have been in on it because it was successful. Well, that's giving George Bush too much credit. Again, I, I I agree with you. I don't believe that the president is really in charge of anything. And you know, if anything, watching him in that school that morning on September 11th, not knowing what to do, waiting for his ex- next order should be uh, should be proof of that to, to the average viewer. I mean, you know, basically I see these presidents, I see these people almost like, and the analogy I use is like Ronald McDonald. You know, he doesn't make the burgers, he doesn't make the, the strategic planning or the five-year plans, he's just on TV in a clown suit selling the burgers to people and that's really what the president of the United States has been reduced to in this country um, yeah, and we, we addressed it in the beginning of the movie when when the CIA agent um, says that you're not talking about that frat boy in Texas are you when they were talking about the who was going to be, become the next president and the, the head of the council says no no I'll, I'll be using um, his cabinet to implement policy and you look at every single cabinet for um, every president since Roosevelt and they're, they've always been completely dominated by the members of the Council on Foreign Relations. So, so they, they, they select who becomes the president, and the president is, is merely the mouthpiece. Right. In the Council on Foreign Relations, this is kind of like a planning committee uh, of the United States. And I always say to people, like, uh, you know, let's say, that, uh, let's say I have a friend who works at Coca-Cola or something, and, you know, they're, they're questioning me on this and saying, oh, you really think that they have these kinds of plans? And I say, well, you know, does Coca-Cola get up every morning and say, well, we're just going to sell some soda today and see what happens? No, they have long-term planning. Communist nations have long-term planning. And so for United States to be in the position 
that it's in with it, with with its military might and all of its uh, dominance around the world. Do you think this just all happened because people got up, you know, or every election just said, okay, let's see what happens with the next president? No, there's a lot of planning, and it happens within these roundtable groups like the the Council on Foreign Relations that you uh, portray in this movie. Yeah, and you could read you could read their documents. Uh, I think their book is called Foreign Affairs and. And you, if you want to find out what direction the United States is going to go into, you know, you read, you read foreign affairs and uh, they lay it out there, what needs to be done. Absolutely. Now, I, I know um, you can't mention the name of the real company that you call Great, Great and Castle in the movie. Um, yeah, you can't mention the real company that that stands for, but could you tell us uh, what this real company specializes in? Well... A lot of different things, electronics, uh, radar systems. Um, they they have uh, built um, a uh, remote controlled aircraft. Um, they have uh, recently uh, built a um, directed energy weapon. Uh, they just uh, just last summer they were able to knock down four drones off the California coast with this directed energy weapon uh, that was ship mounted. Um, they um, are involved in um, uh, HARP up there in Alaska. They have a, uh, they built that for the, uh, for the military. Um, so very, very high technical uh, equipment. Also, too, and I wanted because I got a lot of questions here. I want to make just kind of blow through them and and, and uh, get them in, uh, in in the time we have. Regarding the character Horace Humphreys um, in the film, now was there a basis for a real person who was involved in Defense Management Command for avionics on the Predator program? Yes, there was. Horace Humphrey was a um, yeah. He's a Defense Contract Management Command Center. He actually, I just found something interesting just today about about him. The um, his real name is Herb Homer, and he was listed as being killed at the Pentagon, and then later being listed as being killed on one of the airplanes. Really, but from different media sources or mm-hmm. from from government sources? Yeah, different media sources. Um, well, it, yeah, it, be, it began that, that he died at the Pentagon, and then later it was changed that he died on one of the flights. Okay. Now, and I want to I want to also cover Building Seven because this is something that we hit upon a lot on this show. Because again, we focus usually on the trade towers in Building Seven. Um, what evidence is referred to as being housed in Building Seven? That one had to do with the the SEC, the okay. uh, Security Exchange Commission was was doing a audit um, on the kickbacks of um, the IPO kickbacks a lot of the major banks were involved in. And it was a major investigation. All of the records were kept in Building 7, and then after the uh, the collapse of Building 7, the investigation uh, ended because all the records were destroyed. Now, and that's very important because people always ask me, you know, why did they, well, why would they want to bring down Building 7? Now, you know, I, I don't have the answer, the definitive answer on that. I, you know, again, we focus on the science, and we prove the science proves that the building was a controlled demolition. Case closed. Let's figure out why they did it. But, you know, but there is speculation. There is, uh, I mean, you know, specula- educated speculation, not just, you know, people throwing stuff out there. But this office, this building had off- major offices um, housed in it. FBI, CIA, SEC, like you said. I mean, there was a number of motivations. And, of course, uh, wasn't there files that were, uh, Enron files that were lost in that collapse, too? Oh, I don't know. It could have been. Okay. Uh, I say collapse. It's actually uh, a destruction. What about the C-40 plane that made it possibly appropriate for the adaptation to look like a United Airlines or American Airlines passenger plane? Yeah, a C-40 is a... 737 um, airplane that's used by the military. So it looks similar to a 767 or a 757 because it, it, uh, the configuration is, is basically the same. Okay, so basically because it looks similar. Yes. 
Okay, and finally, and this question was handed to me um, by somebody else before I did this show, and I, it's a great question. It's one that I ask myself, um, but the question goes, what is the basis for, for the premise that the directors of the main TV networks could be told which of the 9-11 video to air or not air? Like the example is the BBC premature announcement by uh, Jane Stanley for you know saying that Building 7 had already collapsed when you can still see the building stand standing there behind her. How does that work, to your knowledge? Because it is amazing. It, and it's one of those things where, you know, your average person who doesn't follow this stuff every day will be skeptical at first and saying, what, they control the BBC, they control CBS, they can, you know, tell them what to do and what not to cover. Um, you know, but but when you look at the evidence and you say, well, yeah, obviously she's telling you the buildings already collapsed. People, networks had pre knowledge of it, and then they lose the video right before it actually did collapse. It looks like there is some kind of pre knowledge being put out there. So, can you talk about that a little bit and a little uh, like how you know from your own research how our media works with government to to play ball when events like this happen? Well, you can go back to the Church Committee uh, hearings back in the seventies when Senator Frank Church found out that uh, he was able to name 300 CIA agents within the media that were uh, controlling things. And on 9-11, if you look at the um, every major media outlet that was airing the, uh, the attacks on 9-11, all, um, they, they discarded all their interviews and all the chaos that was going on down at the, uh, on the ground and they all took their cameras and they focused it on, in on the, the building that had not been hit yet. And there was no airplane in sight, but then all of a sudden an airplane comes in and the big explosion. It, um, some of the uh, different networks actually had the exact same camera angle. Uh, they were just, some of them were zoomed in a little bit closer than the others. But every single network was showing the um, the second plane coming in and, and hitting the building. So it, it had to be very well coordinated. We were operating out of there when we were told the World Trade Center was going to collapse, and it did collapse. Before we that actually dumb collapse. motherfucker. If we hadn't already blown out the uh, lobby in number seven, I'd seen it flew back Center. to the EOC. Now we have a witness reporting explosions of building seven. The building. So we were... Me and Mr. Hess, the corporation counsel, were on the 23rd floor. I told him we got to get out of here. So we started what the hell is he doing at number seven? I think he works for the Emergency Operations four. Center. Big explosion. It you stupid motherfucker. You stupid thought, motherfucker. Make sure ABC we shit cans this. I thought, I thought we were dead. I thought that's it. I started praying to Allah. I said that's it. Sir, BBC is reporting that Building 7 may collapse. Building collapse in New York. You might have heard a few moments ago I was talking about the Salomon Brothers building collapsing, and indeed it has. Who the fuck told him? This morning's attacks. You'll probably find out more about that from our correspondent, Jane Stanley. Jane, what more can you tell us about the Salomon Brothers building and its collapse? Well, only really what you already know. Details are very, very sketchy. Turn around, As bitch! you can see behind me, the trade center... Turn around, the building is still there! It's right behind you! We clouds of smoke and ash. We know that behind that... Cut the feet! ...is an empty Cut piece the BBC of what feet. was a very familiar New York skyline, a symbol of the financial prosperity of the city, but completely disappeared now. I was wondering what it felt like to you being in Manhattan. Well... Well, unfortunately, I think we lost the line with uh, Jane Stanley. Listen to what Dan Rather just said. For the third time today, it's reminiscent of those pictures we've all seen too much on television before. Where a building was deliberately destroyed by a well-placed dynamite... Will somebody please tell Dan Rather to shut Riddle. the fuck Pick up? Worth. Don't let CBS replay that clip. Jesus Christ! A member of the Council on Foreign Affairs telling the world that it looks like Building 7 has been deliberately destroyed. Unfucking believable Where is Goldberg? Ladies' room. In regards to Operation Terror, uh, you know, obviously we know what the reaction of, of people who are asleep and uh, may not be aware of the controversy surrounding 9-11 
is and distributors and things like that. Now, when you screen this to uh, 9/11 truth people, people who are awake, what is the reaction? You know, both. You know, tell us both both positives and uh, and any criticisms you may receive. Well, I would say it's probably 95 percent positive um, or better. Uh, the one, one criticism that, that I had was from a person that asked me if I had screened um, the script in front of uh, dedicated 9-11 truthers before I, before I wrote the script. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that, of course, would not be a, a way to make a movie uh, yeah. because you would never get consensus on what you could use in the movie. And, uh, and, and it had most, mostly to do with, with speculation on how um, the passengers of those airplanes met their demise, um, because, you know, we only know so much about, uh, about what, what had happened to those people. Well, that's a powerful that's a powerful scene, and I'm not going to give it away to the audience. But when they when they land in Cleveland, that's a you know that's a scene that really makes people sit up and, and take notice. Um, what would I mean? Is there anything that you, now that you have a finished product and, and it's a really great finished product? I love the movie, and I encourage everybody to go to OperationTerror.com and buy it and screen it at your local venues, whether it be a library or a museum or whatever kind of cultural center you can find. Show it to people, open their minds up. But um, is there anything now that you you're looking back and you see the finished product that you would change about it if you could? Well, there's a couple of uh, special effects that that could have been better. Um, we we had a really hard time with, with with special effects. We had different artists working on it. Some of them, um, the stuff we just couldn't use at all. It would, it looked so bad, and and uh, it took a long time and a lot of money to get what we had. And um, still, you know, when you're competing against these <laughs> hundred million dollar movies, um, it, it's difficult to make the the special effects uh, look like they do in, in the really big budget movies. And there's so there's a couple of them there that I. That I, um, you know, if I had more money and more time, I would have uh, made a little bit better. Well, you're, yeah, but and this is what I say to the audience. You know, people who want to get hung up on special effects or something like that. I mean, you know, th- this is the essence of the information war and the fact that they were able to put this together, that Art was able to put this together, is amazing. And if somebody is, you know, upset about a certain special effect, well, I mean, this is, you know, the money's not there to create uh, Titanic's level or Avatar level special effects. It's being brought to you by people who are concerned citizens. And, you know, the... Like I think that your average person has a duty to to look past something like that, and I like the fact that you know if, if a special effect is not like you see in a Hollywood movie, I like that because it, I don't know it brings it home to me and it makes it more it makes it seem like it's something that's even more sincere. I don't know, and, and maybe it's just me, but I kind of I kind of like that about the film because then you know that this is coming from a, a legitimate source. It's coming from it's not coming from the same establishment that's giving you zero dark thirty and shoving that official story uh, about the Bin Laden raid down your throat. Um, so that's my my two cents on that. Now, our I want to switch gears before we uh, run out of time here on the show to talk about this conference that you just attended and because I find it very interesting and it's uh, and this is related to 9/11 but it's about Hollywoodism and we've been talking about this a lot on the show um, and it, I think it has a lot to do with why a movie like yours, a script like yours, is not going to get picked up by Warner Brothers or any of the other companies that would be able to make the, the massive special effects that we were talking about. Can you talk about the Hollywood uh, Hollywoodism conference that you just attended? Yeah, they had um, they brought in scholars and uh, filmmakers from around the world to meet in Tehran, and they um, were talking about how to get around the Hollywoodism and, and what Hollywoodism does. Uh, they, you know, they get people to think in a certain way. And, and my, my speech there at the conference was about um, partially about uh, Dark Zero Thirty, uh, how they use Hollywood films to get people to the, accept the premise that we need torture to protect American lives. And, uh, and other people had different angles on, on um, oh, some people have talked about sexuality in, in the movies, and uh, um, but um, and a lot of a lot of political angles that, that we look at uh, in the movies too, and then that uh, how these these movies do uh, put in some political propaganda in the movies to get people to to um, believe in a certain way. 
Yeah, I mean, and that's something I want to go into, and we've talked a little bit on this show, because we've seen it, and, uh, you know, we've covered, we did an hour and a half long episode once on uh, on programs, well, once it was on news, it was on news that attacks 9-11 truth, but we also had examples of programs such as uh, The Beast, which portrayed 9-11 truther as a, a crack addict, you know, lighting up while he's talking that, uh, about the evidence and saying, you know, he didn't, they have him saying that no planes at the tower is ridiculous stuff like that. So do you think think it, I mean, it actually works that the media and programs get a, a call or a letter or some, from somewhere in government say, hey, work this into your plot lines? Because it seems like that to me, and it's very in your face. I think it's actually that direct? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I, I believe that um, that is the case. That uh, it, it, And it's just like anything else. It's like product placement in a movie. You know, there's somebody that does that. That's their job. They're, they, you know, to put the Coca-Cola can in a certain angle um, on the table uh, you know that's that's all part of these these big budget movies and and they yeah, there is there is somebody that uh, would be in charge of that now in what ways have you seen that Hollywood has been used to maintain the official 9/11 lie well <laughs> you've know, got the uh, the movie a uh, whole bunch of movies I guess about the flight 93 you know, the heroes that over uh, overtook the terrorists on that plane and ended up crashing it into the empty field in Shanksville so um, just um, there's there's been there's been several movies that uh, have been done about uh, about 911 that uh, uh, you know and all the big budget movies um, talk about the official version of 911. Well, yeah, and it's funny, I hear people make this joke about, you know, this is why it's called programming, they're programming ideas into you, but I see it, and it's so in your face, and it's getting it's getting more and more in your face as we uh, move towards, you know, uh, further erosion of our civil liberties at home. I can see this in TV plots where, you know, you'll take some crazy circumstance where uh, some guy may have killed a hundred little girls or something, and, he, and rather than telling him where the bodies are, he'll insist that he sees his lawyer and they'll make sure that he's really smug as he says it. And then they'll give the lawyer a hard time as he comes in to basically do his job to defend his client in our American justice system, our republic. Everyone's got a right to a lawyer and uh, to a a speedy trial. And it it puts in people's minds this idea that anybody that asserts their rights is related to this serial killer. You could also see this after 9-11 when they were selling torture, too. Like, they would take an extreme circumstance, like, I I don't know, three nuclear bombs are going to go off in America unless we torture this guy. And it suddenly brings it home and makes it more justifiable to the audience. Because you relate it to this crazy circumstance that they saw on TV, but it makes more sympathy for what is a, a authoritarian aims that we would have never tolerated before 9-11. Now, um, Operation Terror, and I can't say this enough, I and mean, people need to go to, a, to OperationTerror.com and check that out. It's not even a movie that people in the 9-11 Truth Movement, all of them have, have heard about yet. What can people do to help you out, Art, and get this, in, this movie into theaters? I mean, what can they do to spread the word about Operation Terror? Well, it would be tough to get into the theaters, but um, what my main audience was, was people that understand what happened on 9-11 to buy the DVD, to sit down with their friends and family and watch an entertaining 92-minute movie, which um, is easy to do. And I just got a letter yesterday from an attorney down in, in Southern California that did this, and he said that he had his wife and his daughter watch the movie and finally, he said, you know, after years of telling them what happened on 9-11, they finally understood how this could have happened. Um, they never believed them before, but after the movie, then they understood how this whole thing could happen. So it, it's, just, it's just a great way to, to introduce people to the, uh, the events that happened on 9-11. You're right, and I think that's a very important part of what this movie does. It's kind of a gateway to 9-11 truth. Uh, you know, obviously, it's not supposed to be the definitive word of everything that happened on that day, but what it does is it paints a picture of how this could be, how it is possible. And I think that's something that a lot of us in the movement don't... Uh, don't touch upon it, or that's something that, that, that it's a niche that doesn't get scratched by people in the movement who just focus on the facts. Yes, uh, for some people, for certain people like myself, the science is the definitive word. I mean, and it, and it is the definitive word in the end. But still, something I always run into in people is they say, "Well, 
yeah, you're right about that building seven, and yeah, it makes sense. I I just don't see how many how so many people could be involved with it. I just don't see how uh, you know how could they could be so evil to do something like this. But when you put it all together like this, when you put it in this this drama played out for 90 minutes and you see these people go through this process and you see the compartmentalization and you see uh, people basically carry it out with the same kind of uh, cold-blooded intent that you would see from a serial killer that doesn't, uh, you know, that doesn't have any remorse for what he does to his victims. And that's what you see, too, in this movie because, you know, it's, it's not that they're even acting crazy. They act like your average person, but they still are per- carrying out this crazy thing. Then it brings it home. Then it makes it more human and it makes it something that you can conceive of, and I think that's the the genius of what you accomplish with this movie art. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And if people want to go further than just showing their friends and family the movie, um, a great way to do this is to use a local community center or get a hold of somebody in a local college to be able to show it there. Um, and if it's if it's shown for free, uh, we don't charge anything to to show the movie. Uh, if if you want to make a commercial venture out of it. Um, then what we do is we just give you um, DVDs at a discount that you're able to sell uh, after the showing. Uh, we, we typically, uh, on one of our showings, we get about 30% of the people that watch the movie end up buying the movie after they see it, which is amazing. I mean, I can't imagine any other kind of movie where you, you just watch the movie and then you want to go out and buy the DVD. DVD immediately after watching the movie. Um, but, but that's what we get. And, uh, so it's, it's um, they're having public showings is a, is a great way to to spread the truth. You're right, and folks, you're hearing it here. A lot of people may be turned off by the idea of having to do that because they may not know what kind of legal hoops they have to jump through in order to uh, to do that. They may think the process is more complicated. But you're hearing it from uh, the ma- one of the makers of the film. If you're if you're screening it for free, just go ahead and screen it for free, and then you can you know contact Art over at Operation Terror, and they'll give you further details like he just outlined uh, to make it a commercial venture. But you can help these great people out. I mean, Art put his own money into making this. And spread the word at least, you know, show the DVDs at least, find a way to engage people. And again, you do a screening of Operation Terror at your local community center or if you're a student, do it at your university. You're going to meet like minded people and a groups will form and from that change will sprout. Are there any final words that um, that you want to tell our audience? No, I just uh, encourage everybody to watch the trailer at Operation Terror dot com and uh Hopefully they'll buy the DVD and we'll we'll get the get the word out. All right, you heard it right there, folks. OperationTerror.com. Check it out. All right, I want to thank you for coming on 911 Freefall. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. All right, folks, that is the end of the show. We are out of time. Remember, you can listen to us on No Lies Radio every Thursday night at 10 o'clock Eastern, 7 o'clock Pacific. This is Andy Steele saying goodbye, good luck, and have a great week. 